Our guest today at AICGS is uh, Dr. Volker Pertus. He is the executive director of uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, which uh, loosely translated means uh, it's the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Volker Pertus is in Washington for a visit uh, and he's spoken to various other colleagues at uh, Think Tank and in government. And uh, we will start by asking him, first of all, uh, Mr. Pertus, uh, What's your impression regarding uh, the challenge of Ukraine? What did you learn in Washington? What are you taking back to Berlin? I, I have the impression that the Obama administration and the Europeans are much more in sync than some American commentators and probably some European commentators uh, would want to have it or, or, or think it is. Um, it seems that everybody is looking at the situation with, with rather cold blood, um, trying to find a way out, um, realizing that uh, even though we have a serious problem with, with Russian policy here, uh, we will need Russia and we will need to work with Russia on various issues of international politics uh, even in the future regardless of this dispute and of, uh, of Russian behavior. And the question now is uh, how do we get out of this right. impasse? How do, uh, you know, uh, what is the message that uh, should be conveyed to Putin because so far uh, anything that the West has decided including now adding a new ho a series of names on, uh, on, uh, on the sanctions list is probably not going to heed uh, many results. No, I don't think. And we, we, I don't think so. We, and we know from other sanctions that uh, you, can, you can have what we used to call small, smart sanctions against individuals. Um, in the end, they turn out not to be so smart. Um, yes, you're hurting individuals. And yes, you can signal that you are deeply unhappy with the policy of an adversary or of a partner. But this may not change their calculation. I think what may change Putin's and his elites, his surroundings calculations, is basically what I call they are sanctioning themselves. Mm -hmm. They are sending signals to, let's say, these uh, 9,000 small and medium entrepreneurs of Germany who have been investing in Russia that this may be a risky investment. Uh, they are sending a message to the Europeans, uh, to basically all European countries, that we should think how to get uh, less dependent on, on Russian energy. And so they have, they have triggered something which, which now is happening and which, which will cost them a lot and which will cost them much more than, than individual sanctions we are going to apply. Do you think this time it will have a lasting impact? Because we remember also the crisis in Georgia uh, almost five years ago. Uh, there were voices saying, oh, this is, this is a bad sign. This is a return of history on, on the European continent. The post-Cold War order is being challenged by, uh, by the Kreml, um, Kremlin. Uh, but then things sort of quieted down and uh, we went back to business as usual. Well, I think, so. I, I think the Georgia situation was a bit different because um, what, whatever the, the background to the crisis, um, it wasn't the, the Russians that fired the first shots. Um, and, and we put a lot of blame on the, the Georgian uh, administration, Saakashvili's uh, administration at that time, I still think rightly, rightly so. Mm -hmm. uh, this time it is different. Um, this time we are seeing that uh, uh, Russia uh, has staged aggressive moves against an independent countries whose integrity uh, the Russian government had guaranteed together, together with others in the so-called Budapest Memorandum. Uh, about 20 years ago. So this shouldn't have happened. And, mm -hmm. and of course, we, we cannot let it go unanswered. At the same time, yes, at some point, we would love to go back to business. But that means that, uh, that Russia and Europe would find a way to play by the rules together. Uh, and, and here, I think clearly, the Russian government has broken the rules, which we thought we had all agreed upon. Uh, we still wish a Russia which is democratic, which plays to the rules, which has an interest in maintaining uh, a common uh, security order in all of Europe. And I guess at some point we will still be there. I mean, no one wants to exclude Russia from Europe. But we, would, we have lost faith in, 
the willingness uh, of Vladimir Putin to at least adhere to some of those principles that you just listed? Yes, and we are certainly revising some of our assumptions about where we are in Europe. I mean, we, we have used expressions in, in EU contexts, in NATO contexts, in, in domestic contexts, such as um, security community or common security, such as strategic partnership. Uh, this doesn't seem to be accurate to describe the relation we are having with Russia. For the past few years, mm. Europe has been all consumed mm. uh, by the Euro crisis. Right. Now we have this different challenge mm -hmm. at the outer borders, at the fringes mm. of the European Union. Which one of the two challenges do you think will have the biggest and lasting impact on the European Union? Well, the uh, financial crisis or the sovereign debt crisis has had its impact. I think the, the, the Europeans have, have become more serious in getting their own act together here, creating institutions. We are not just, we're still not there where we have to be, but, but I think we are on the way in creating the institutions that make the Eurozone uh, much more stable, much more sustainable, um, that uh, uh, integrates uh, the Eurozone states uh, with one another in a, in a much more sustainable way. So, so Europe has taken its lesson here from a crisis. And I, I don't think it's so different in the US, but, but we all always start getting active when a crisis pushes us yeah. uh, into, into this kind of activity. Now we have a foreign policy and security policy challenge uh, in Europe, in our neighborhood, or as I would say, in our and Russia's common neighborhood. And I think this was all, will also push the Europeans closer together. I mean, we are seeing that uh, that um, I think serious moves are being undertaken now. It will take time, but to have a more serious uh, common European energy policy, uh, which doesn't mean that we don't want to import energy from Russia in the future. What, but it means that we have uh, to hedge our bets, basically, that, not to be dependent. So uh, we much. will we will become less dependent on, on one source or one major source. Um, and uh, it's not just, I guess, it is not just talking about uh, reducing dependencies, uh, but when we see that actually things are happening in Slovakia now, for example, with installing uh, uh, the, um, uh, the necessary uh, equipments uh, for reverse flows in uh, in pipelines. I mean, that's concrete action which mm -hmm. is happening and quite necessary. When uh, political actors try to uh, force or persuade somebody, an adversary, to move, mm -hmm. uh, one of the first steps is trying to understand where they're coming from, why they're doing mm -hmm. the things that they're doing, and how they perceive things. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that Vladimir Putin, looking at Europe in the past few years, and that's why I would like to link, maybe, if there is a link, the Ukraine crisis to the Euro crisis, has had the impression that the Europeans are fractured, uh, that uh, nation states are being more powerful now than they used to be pre-Euro crisis, and that it th therefore it would be easier for him, given the crisis fatigue that there is in, in the Eurozone, in the European Union, for him to act without having to pay a price. Look, I don't, I don't know, and I, I, I think it's it's too too difficult to to try to find out what he may have been thinking. What what we do know is that we probably also haven't listened to the signals we got from Putin and and the elite surrounding him. Um, we thought that the signals of his, let me call it, unhappiness with European moves are uh, probably signaling that he would be prepared to take stronger action, even action outside of international law. Um, we didn't hear that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think particularly the European Commission was too technical on, in its approach to Ukraine, not political enough, not thinking. Uh, in a geostrategic or geopolitical way, just sort of as we Europeans usually are, thinking that everything is, we're doing is, is for the good and for the good of mankind and our partners, and not actually being able to understand that for 
some of our partners in Europe, that for Russia in particular, the security dilemma is still there, and uh, um, and and the association of Ukraine with Europe, uh, rightly or wrongly, I would say wrongly, is seen as an encroachment on mm -hmm. something. What, what Russia sees at its security space. So when details were leaked about uh, the phone conversation, one of the phone conversations yeah. uh, during the crisis between the Chancellor, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Barack Obama, and she reportedly said that uh, in previous conversation that she had with Putin, mm -hmm. he was of another world. He thought uh, in a completely different manner than, than the West would. Uh, basically, that mm -hmm. feeling is mutual. You know, she thought he wasn't of another world, but in a way, Putin as well thinks that uh, the West, or at least the European Union member states, are when thinking that we have reached a sort of post post historic stage, and uh, and that we can settle things in a, in an always uh, diplomatic and institutionalized way. I think it's one way of putting it. And uh, um, if you speak of uh, Sort of ethnic solidarities uh, being more important than than borders or cooperation agreement or international guarantees. Um, I would say this is not what what I would see as 21st century politics. Um, at the same time, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Putin may well think that the Europeans simply don't understand what the security considerations of a major power are. So, looking forward. Right. And, and given what has happened so far, mm -hmm. uh, if you had a conversation tomorrow with the Chancellor, uh, and with Barack Obama for that matter, what would you tell them? How do we get out of this? I don't know how we get out of that, but uh, I, I guess that, or I think what, what we have to do is, is a couple of things. Uh, it is A, to reassure our um, Eastern partners in NATO and the EU to, to make very clear to them, and at the same time very clear to Russia, uh, that Article 5 counts. Second, not to give up. This the is the trigger within, the Na within NATO for military support for one of the member states. Well, it's a solidarity clause in, being in NATO, right, which means that an attack on, on any one country is an attack in on NATO all. is an attack on all. So we should make very clear because I don't think it that Article 5 is in doubt, but some people wanted to draw it in doubt. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we have to be very clear here about that. Only with that, only if, our, if all NATO members are reassured, we can maintain what I think is the important vision of coming back to, to pan-European security arrangements, a common European order, which of course has to include Russia mm -hmm. and also respect Russian interests. Um, we have to work together on Ukraine. I think it is more important to stabilize Ukraine than to sanction Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may say this is not an either or, but, but if you say any political moves will cost us quite some taxpayers' money in Europe and probably also in the US, where do we want to put it? Where we, will we sort of want to, to waste it by, by ruining trade and investments? Uh, with Russia, maybe we have to do that. Or want to, do we want to take quite some money into the hand, into our hands, and, and try to do a job creation program in eastern Ukraine uh, in order to make these people feel part of Ukraine? I think stabilizing Ukraine is much more important, uh, in not only in the long run, also in the short run, uh, than, than thinking about punitive measures. Last word on the spillover effects, on right. what this means. Uh, for other challenges and around the world, and without looking into Asia, which is probably a little bit too far away, uh, but more specifically uh, in uh, the wider Middle East region. Uh, what do you think the spillover effects are there on Syria, for instance, or the current negotiations uh, with Iran on its nuclear program? Well, up to today, we don't have any spillover effects. But of course, everybody else is watching what the Europeans, the Americans, and the Russians are doing with one another, and whether they still would be able, despite their conflict over Ukraine, to, to cooperate on other global security matters. And here, actually, Asia may not be too far away. If tomorrow, God forbid, something happens in North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, that would be a real test whether, uh, whether Russians and NATO uh, are able to to dealing the crisis in Europe from other 
global security business, which actually needs our cooperation. Uh, in the negotiations with Iran, which you mentioned, so far, the six countries that are negotiating on behalf of the UN uh, with Iran have been standing together and have been following more or less, including Russia, a common, including Russia, a common, a common agenda. Because I think we do have a common interest: a to solve this issue with Iran, bring Iran uh, back into the fold, and at the same time not have Iran develop a uh, military nuclear capacity. Thank you very much. You're most welcome.